So we've talked about the mathematics of diffusion, uh, specifically looking at uh, fixed first law and fixed second law. Now we want to talk a little bit about the influence of temperature on diffusion. Um, in general, I'll just begin and say that there's there are other factors that could influence diffusion. Um, the obvious one is is that the, the materials that are involved are going to play a role, right? So. Uh, if we choose a different solute atom or different solvent atoms, then we would expect the diffusion uh, coefficient uh, to be different, right? So that's that's uh, not too uh, surprising. But within the same system, if we choose our solute and our solvent atoms, there are other things that we can do uh, to, to affect the diffusion coefficient. And the primary factor, at least for this class that we're going to focus on, is that we can change the temperature, okay? So remember what we talked about before about what's required for diffusion to actually occur. Uh, rec recall that we had to have sufficient energy to break the bonds from wherever it, from whatever wherever an atom resided to wherever it wanted to jump to, and we had to have an available site to jump to, right? And that had to either be a vacancy or an interstitial. So. Uh, I'm not. This isn't a derived uh, equation, but empirically we observe that the diffusion coefficient follows an Arrhenius form, which you've seen before. Uh, it, fo it follows the form that looks as follows, where this is our equation, where d is the diffusion coefficient that we use in both fixed first and second law. D naught is some constant that's independent of temperature. Um, K is our Boltzmann constant, or we could use R as our gas constant, depending on um, on uh, the the units that our activation energy is in. T is a, is temperature, and remember it's the absolute temperature, so you'll want to use Kelvin there. And then Q is activation energy, just like we had for vacancies. So just I want you to note here that the form that we have here is very similar to the form that we had for the equilibrium vacancy concentration. And in fact, this, this form crops up everywhere in material science. It's called an Arrhenius form. I think I've mentioned that before. Um, but, but when in doubt, if you don't know uh, uh, the, the functional form for a particular phenomena, uh, this is always a good guess as a starting point, okay? So let's, let's look a little bit uh, more into what this uh, equation means for uh, diffusion. So obviously the equation is exponential, and so it means that there's an exponential uh, dependence of the diffusion coefficient on temperature. Okay, so uh, some of you have asked in, in office hours and things like that, um, you know, why is it that we don't worry about diffusion uh, after the fact, you know, if we carburize something, why is it that we don't worry about the carbon atoms diffusing out of wherever we've carburized? The answer is that because we have this exponential um, dependence on temperature, we carburize at a high temperature, and and the diffusion coefficient is orders of magnitude less at the operating temperatures. Okay, so what this graph is showing you on the x-axis is is a uh, a measure of temperature. Notice here that it's a thousand uh, Kelvin divided by the temperature. Okay, so what that means is that uh, as we go up on the x-axis, the temperature is actually uh, going down, and and then on the y-axis, we're plotting the diffusion coefficients. Right. So if you need a, a reference to, here's the temperature in Celsius. Okay. So this is plotting diffusion coefficients for carbon in alpha iron. Uh, for aluminum in aluminum, so that would be self-diffusion. For iron in alpha iron, uh, for iron in gamma iron, right? This is FCC, this is BCC, and then for carbon in, in um, uh, gamma iron, okay? And a couple things to note, so if we were to draw a line here, uh, the, you know, the, the diffusion coefficients are, let's say in this region, are look like 10 to the minus 14 for these, uh, for iron, iron, and aluminum. Whereas for our carbon atoms in iron, it looks like it's like maybe 10 to the minus 9-ish, right? So orders of magnitude uh, higher diffusion coefficients for that carbon. And the thing that you should note is that the carbon exists as an interstitial. And we talked about that before, uh, but this is just sort of highlighting it for you again, is that the interstitial diffusion is going to be much faster than substitutional diffusion. So aluminum and aluminum is, is diffusion via vacancy diffusion with self-interstitials. I mean, sorry, not with self-interstitials, with uh, self-diffusion, rather. Iron, obviously, is not an interstitial in itself. It's it's uh, uh, just va via vacancy diffusion. And the same thing with iron and gamma iron as well. 
So the idea here is that the diffusion coefficients for interstitials, much, much larger than the diffusion coefficients for substitutionals. Uh, and as a result, interstitial diffusion is much faster than vacancy diffusion. Okay. Uh, how about determining what the activation energy is? Well, this, we, we're going to take the same approach that we took for computing the vacancy activation energy. Um, and so we have a graph that looks like this. This is plotting it, plotting the diffusion coefficient just as a function of temperature. And we end up with some exponential. There's our equation that we showed you before. And if we take the natural log of both sides, we end up with this equation that says it becomes linear, right? Natural log of D is equal to the natural log of D naught minus QD over KT, right? So we end up with this straight line. And the slope is going to basically give us the activation energy, obviously divided by K, but we can just essentially read off the activation energy from the slope. And then the intercept gives us that D naught term. Okay. Uh, one more feature about this is that we can readily relate diffusion coefficients at different temperatures using just the activation energy. You did something very similar to this for vacancies where we asked about, well, what's the, if, if you knew the vacancy uh, equilibrium concentration at some temperature T1 um, and I raised the temperature to some T2, what's the new, um, what's, and I gave you an activation energy, what's the new um, uh, equilibrium vacancy concentration? Well, same sort of idea uh, applies here. So let's say at, at temperature T1, we know that we have this equation log of D1, where, where we know D1 uh, is going to be equal to natural log of D0 minus QD over KT1. And then at some temperature 2, well, that equation, that equation still holds. Uh, QD and D0 have not changed. Uh, only D2 and T2 have changed. So in this case, we just subtract those two equations. Right, D, so we have log of D2 minus log of D1. The natural logs of D0 right here, those cancel each other out and go away. And we're left with just this negative QD over K term times the quantity 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. We rearrange that. Basically, we're just going to bring this log of D1 to the right-hand side. And then we take the exponential uh, of both sides. This becomes then D2 is equal to D1 times the uh, e to the negative QD over K uh, times the difference of the reciprocals of the temperatures. Okay, so uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, again, very similar to what you've seen for vacancies. But uh, just be aware that uh, when we talk about diffusion in materials, uh, the, that, that the, the temperature at which it's happening is a critical factor in, in the speed at which diffusion occurs and in controlling uh, that uh, diffusion coefficient D.